So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we have started looking at James Joyce's short story uh, Araby which is part of the collection that we are covering Dubliners. So uh, in my last lecture which was the introductory lecture for this particular text, we talked about how the language uh, is very very important in the story because it's a very interesting combination of different linguistic registers the religious register, the erotic register, uh, the secular register, the political register, they all come together to create this very confused uh, linguistic landscape uh, which is a very interesting reflection of a confused adolescent imagination in the case of the boy over here. I mean superficially this is a love story but the, the way it is presented to us is very interesting because it takes us uh, sort of deep into the mind of the adolescent uh, young male imagination falling in love with this woman. And we find there are desperate strategies or desperate uh, attempts uh, to appropriate a very knightly chivalrous register of uh, you know romance. So he talks about how uh, he imagines himself bearing the chalice uh, through a throng of foes which is the very very medieval image of the knight bearing chalice among infidels. So the love object, the object of love becomes uh, almost like a religious icon for him uh, and his pursuit of love becomes like a religious quest for him. So again we have this interesting combination of the religious and the erotic put together in a very confused register. Now if you remember the section where we ended uh, this lecture last time was where this almost this momentous occasion where the girl sp speaks to the boy for the first time and she asks him uh, whether or not she, he's going to Araby and that's the first time the word Araby is mentioned, uh, the fair, the bazaar which is the setting of the story. And as I have, may have mentioned already, uh, Araby is an interesting example over here because it's a metaphor of the, for the exotic because Araby uh, obviously comes from Arabia. But the bazaar which was set in Dublin at that point in time, uh, it used to sort of display the different markets from the Orient. Uh, right? It's this very exotic, essentialized idea of the Orient in a Western imagination. And so that bazaar becomes uh, the exotic space, the fairy tale space, the utopian space. Uh, so to say, uh, for the very decadent Western citizen. So that bazaar would be like a quest to go and get something from there uh, and gift it to the beloved. So it so retains the knightly structure, the chivalrous structure of romance. So as you can see, uh, there is this very interesting uh, mimicry of the mythic method. Uh, so the boy is trying to mimic uh, the kind of narratives he has consumed about love, about romance, etc. Uh, in a sense he wants to go uh, to this fairy tale place and get something for his beloved uh, uh, and carry it and protect it among a throng of foes in a way that a knight would um, in medieval times. So he's comparing, he's equating himself with a knight and is equating his love uh, with a knightly romantic quest uh, to get something like a great legend, a holy grail uh, for this beloved. So what we see over here is an elevation with a very mundane, <coughs> excuse me, very mundane uh, level to something uh, a very very deep anxiety to appropriate a, you know, a super level, uh, almost cosmic level and almost uh, you know, hyper romantic level of narrative in the sense that he wants to appropriate those markers, you know, shallows, knightly romance, lady love, etc. and everyone else around uh, like enemies of romance, dragons and infidels, etc. So just to very quickly uh, recap the section where we ended last time, uh, this little paragraph which should be on the screen now where uh, it is told to us, at last she spoke to me. So there's a degree of finality and momentousness about this uh, little sentence. At last she spoke to me. It's like an epoch, uh, it's like a paradigm shift in this romantic narrative. When she addressed the first words to me, I was so confused that I did not know what to answer. She asked me, was I going to Araby? I forgot whether I answered yes or no. It would be a splendid bazaar. She said she would love to go. So again, the whole idea of Araby and the equation of Araby with desire is uh, being set up over here. She would love to go to Araby. So right? the obvious implication is she possibly can't go, practically speaking. Right? So it would be a splendid bazaar. She said she would love to go. And this is told to him as well. And why can't he? I asked. While she spoke, she turned a silver bracelet round and round her wrist. So again, the, uh, look at the biblical metaphors over here, the markers, a silver bracelet. Uh, silver is the, uh, the, the marker uh, which was sort of biblically used as a marker of betrayal that was what is paid uh, for betraying Christ. So silver over here is interesting, that metaphor of betrayal, that metaphor of fall is presented to us in a very really surreptitious way. So we've seen how this biblical markers are littered in this landscape. 
uh, in Dublin. I mean, we have this central apple tree with a few straggling bushes around it. Uh, we have this uh, very serpentile alley in which the, um, you know, the North Richmond Street is situated. And of course, a dead priest uh, is a constant marker of the absent faith or the annihilation, the departed faith, so to say. Okay, so Silva uh, corroborates that biblical uh, marker narrative that we see already uh, in operation in this particular story. So while she spoke, she turned a silver bracelet around and round her wrist. She cannot go, she said, because there would be a retreat that week in a convent. So again, look at the way in which religion uh, holds you back from desire, holds you back from fantasy uh, in this particular setting. If you remember the opening of the story, uh, it was told to us that not, not Richmond Street being blind was a quiet street except for the R when the Christian Brothers School said the boys free. So again, the school had held them non-free for a period of time. So the very fact that school is setting them free at a particular hour uh, obviously implies that they were not free uh, during that time that they were inside the school. So religion over here obviously is a form of imprisonment and that is corroborated over here when she tells uh, the boy that she cannot go to Arabi despite her desire because there will be some retreat uh, in that week in a convent. So again, the convent over here uh, is used as a prison metaphor. Her brother and two other boys were fighting for the caps and I was alone at the railings. Now this is a point in the story where she, the narrator begins to depart from her uh, erstwhile playmates, his erstwhile playmates. So again, if you look at the way in which language is used to, to mark the departure, mark the alienation, which is also an elevation in a certain sense, because he used to be one of them. He used to be, uh, you know, mucking around with them in terms of playing the little boyish games. But now he's suddenly matured into romance, he's suddenly matured into love, and everything else around him looks like child's play. So suddenly he has this very patronizing adult look, and look at the way in which the gaze is maturing uh, by being erotic. So the eroticization of the gaze is part of the maturity process, and that has been reflected in the use of language. Uh, he's literally distancing himself, and the gaze is distancing himself from his erstwhile companions, where he used to be one of them, but now he's looking down on them, quite literally. So the, again, it's very, very camera-like, that gaze, right? So uh, they are being gazed at as being outsiders to this romantic landscape that he's inhabiting at the moment. So the eroticization of the narrative and the maturation of the narrative are happening together and what is being excluded from that erotic uh, mature uh, narrative is the erstwhile child's play in which he was a part of at one point in time. So her brother and two other boys were fighting for the calves and I was alone at the railings. She held one of the spikes, bowing her head towards me. The light from the lamp opposite her door caught the white curve of her neck, lit up her hair that rested there, and falling, lit up a hand upon the railing. It fell over one side of her dress and caught the white border of a petticoat, just visible as she stood at ease. So again, the gaze is very, very erotic, but also very metonymic, right? So look at the metonymic quality of the gaze. It's all in fragments. It's falling on her neck, falling on a little part of her hair, uh, falling on a petticoat, uh, falling on her shoulder. So very, very cinematic. It's like a photoplay uh, of different uh, eroticized zones, which are being gazed at by this male imagination. It's well for you, she said. If I go, I said, I will bring you something. So again, uh, it's a very nightly promise made to the beloved. If I go to Araby, I'll bring you something. It's a profound promise, uh, almost pompous in quality. Uh, but this is, again, part of the appropriation process. And he's trying to appropriate the nightly uh, rhetoric of going to an um, inimical space, going to this fantasy land among enemies, uh, suffering enemies and dragons in the way, and bringing something very, very momentous, like a chalice or like a holy grail or something of that sort. So again, in his imagination, uh, everything is transported into that you know, nightly landscape. And that's something which is, again, part of the love process, part of the eroticization process, which is maturing him into that kind of a landscape. Right? So everything around him, this banal Dublin, is suddenly very, very banal and very, very childish, uh, despite the fact he was a part of it like a week ago. But he's very quickly maturing into a different kind of landscape in his mind. And the markers are changed and the markers are being filled in with mythical nightly uh, settings or markers from that setting. Okay, and you find immediately after this, everything else will become like a painful process of wait for him. Everything else will become, uh, all these other practical, banal things around him will be enemies for his quest. And uh, temporality will be very interestingly represented. Uh, suddenly time will become a very uh, painful process of experience. Uh, it's not something that you, you know, live. It's something which you suffer because it's stopping him from going to his quest, right? So temporality is uh, definitely decelerated. 
uh, in this point of time. Everything slows down for him and it's part of the painful process which stops him from going to Araby. And this is exactly what he said to us and this should be on the screen. What innumerable follies laid waste my waking and sleeping thoughts after that evening. So after the evening, everything else becomes a painful process of wait. I wish to annihilate the tedious intervening days. So again, temporality becomes part of the dragon process. Time is a dragon in this particular setting. And he wants to annihilate the dragon. He wants to get to the uh, Araby, the fantasy space, and pick something from his beloved. I wish to annihilate the tedious intervening days. A chaffed against the work of school. At night in my bedroom and by day in the classroom, her image came between me and the page I strove to read. The syllables of the word Araby were called to me through the silence in which my soul luxuriated and cast an eastern enchantment over me. So again, eastern enchantment is a very typically um, western way of looking at the Orient as some kind of exotic fantasy space which is obviously hyper romanticized, hyper sexualized, hyper essentialized, etc. Right? So eastern enchantment is that magic uh, gaze that is conferred on the Orient, which is part of the very Eurocentric process, uh, Eurocentric way of looking at the Eastern world, right? So China, India, all these were like very exotic landscapes. And that exotic landscape, the exotic geographical landscape is equated with the mindscape that he has in his mind. So in his mind, Araby is an Eastern land and he's sort of going to Araby. And we find that he'll go on a train, a Dublin, a very banal Dublin train. And that train will become in his mind uh, this uh, nightly horse that he's traveling to go to the space to pick something up for his beloved. So again, this constant transportation, this constant shuffling between different kind of markets is something which we find very, very interesting in the story. Right. So, you know, the entire, the word Araby would just be conjured up in his mind and will cast an easel enchantment over me. I asked for leave to go to the bazaar on Saturday night. My aunt was surprised and I hope it wasn't some free mess in affair. So again, look at the way in which how very, very topical, politically uh, potent things are very casually mentioned, Freemason affair. So Freemasons were the secret society of Jesuits, uh, this alternative Jesuit uh, narrative in Dublin, which had its branches in many of the parts of the world, including Calcutta. Uh, so Freemason society uh, was something which was looked down upon by the Catholic Church. And it was attractive to the dissenters of Dublin, uh, who most people were very unhappy with the church. So they joined the society as some kind of a dissent process. So the aunt was surprised that, you know, he's, uh, there's this fear, this panic for young men, especially young men, to join the Freemason Society. And he, she wanted to make sure that he's not being seduced uh, to join the Freemason affair. I answered three questions in class. I watched my master's face pass from amiability to sternness. He hoped that I wasn't beginning to idle, right? So again, uh, the master is obviously a Jesuit priest um, and uh, he's fearing that the boy is beginning to idle, which is uh, like a sin according to this, uh, this biblical narrative that he's you know, very, very firmly planted in. I could not call my wandering thoughts together. I had hardly any patience with the serious work of life, which, now that it stood between me and my desire, seemed to me child's play, ugly, monotonous child's play. It's very tempting to do a solid Freudian reading of this particular setting. I mean, obviously, uh, most of you know that most of Freud's series have been refuted, but, you know, it's beautifully uh, Freudian in that sense. So everything between him and his desire is child's play. So everything between him and Eros is essentially Thanatos, if you use the Freudian vocabulary. So everything is like a death drive, and he just wants to go for his desired drive. And everything that stops him from his desire becomes ugly, monotonous child's play. And interestingly, how the way child's play is inverted is, uh, you know, child's play obviously over here is very banal, is very mundane, is, is non-erotic. It's something which stops him from his erotic landscape, from his, uh, you know, love landscape, from his desire landscape. And, you know, everything that is stopping him from desire is becoming an enemy in his imagination. It's making him monotonous, it's making him melancholy, is uh, impeding his ego, uh, which wants to feed off the desire, right? So it's very, very classically Freudian uh, in that particular, this particular line. I had hardly any patience with a serious work of life. Now the distributed between me and my desire seemed to be child's play, ugly, monotonous child's play. So every form of banality around him, every form of practicality around him becomes a monotonous child's play. So notice the way in which a very condescending uh, uh, gaze has been conferred on his activities. It's like it's a child's play. I don't take it seriously. The only serious thing that I have in my mind now is my desire to go to Arabi. Uh, and also look at the way in which 
the markers of desire keep shifting in the story. Uh, first it was manga and sister, and now it's shifted to Araby. So that's a desire place, the desire space he wants to go and consume and then come back. Right? So the markers of desire, the signifiers of desire keep shifting very, very quickly. And of course, that is reflective of a very confused, adolescent, uh, sexualized imagination that he's you know, suffering and experiencing uh, as an adolescent male. Okay. On Saturday morning, I reminded my uncle that I wished to go to the bazaar in the evening. He was fussing at the whole stand, looking for the hat brush and answered me curtly. Yes, boy, I know. Again, look at the way in which the absent parents are such a potent presence in the story. Uh, he's brought up by his uncle and aunt. I mean, we sort of guess that the relationship he has with uncle and aunt is not quite uh, nice, not quite pleasant. Uh, the only adults mentioned are the uncle and the aunt and the stern schoolmaster. So it is obviously a loveless landscape in which this boy is situated. So his desire for love is really uh, essentially, again, very Freudian way, uh, he is in love with the feeling of being in love because that is quite literally absent in the landscape that he is growing up in. So he's got a stern aunt, a stern uncle, and a stern schoolmaster. Uh, these are the only adults available to him in his growing up process. So for the first time in his life, um, presumably, he's falling in love, he's experiencing love. And that, of course, is a very, very erotic experience and he doesn't quite know how to acknowledge and experience it. And hence, it's very confused vocabulary in which he's using to describe the process, describe the experience. Okay? So, uh, the curtness of the uncle's response is reflective of the lovelessness in which he's situated. Uh, he was fussing at the whole stand, looking for a hat brush and answer me curtly. Yes, boy, I know. So again, it's not son. Yes, boy, I know. So, language is extremely important in choice. Each word tells you something. This is why he's such a difficult writer to read and unpack. Right? So, yes, boy, I know. Not yes, son, I know. Not yes, darling, I know. Okay, so he's already addressed as a young male, uh, presumably, you know, is expected to be responsible and a proper Christian in a Dublin setting. As he was in a hall, I could not get, I could not go to the front parlour and lie at the windows. Again, look at the way in which the adult is stopping him from his movement of desire. As he was in a hall, I could not go to the front parlour and lie at the window. See, all the adults in the story, as you can see, are all enemies of romance, are all enemies of fantasy, all enemies of uh, imagination, uh, so to say. So we have this Peter Pan world where all the children play and grow up together, and we have this adult enemies around it who are essentially uh, inimical to any idea, any experience of romance. So even spatially speaking, you see how the same house is broken down into romantic zones and non-romantic zones, but in fantasy zones and non-fantasy zones. So the presence of the adult, the non-parent adult, the non-loving adult is obviously an enemy to romance. So as he was in the hall, I could not go to the front parlour. So he's stopping me, spatially speaking, to going from going to the front parlour and experience my romance. I left the house in Bad Hema and walked slowly towards the school. The air was pitilessly raw and already my heart misgave me. So again, the pitilessness of the air is, is, is important for us. The rawness of the air is important for us and already his heart is misgiving him. So he's already beginning uh, to get suspicions about this entire idea of romance. And he's already beginning to feel this might be a failed quest. Because uh, remember, he's a knight in his own imagination. He's in a knight, a knightly situation, knightly mode uh, in his own imagination, and he wants to make it as momentous and profound as a knightly narrative. And obviously, his heart is misgiving him, and is desperately trying to convert Dublin into a knightly landscape, into a chivalrous medieval uh, landscape of romance, which is very hard to do given the decadence of Dublin uh, in this particular historical point of time. Okay, uh, because you know. If you remember the soundscape that he described before, it's about the shrill litanies of short boys and also numerous ballads about the troubles of a native land. This is a Dublin which is politically very, very volatile. This is a Dublin which is obviously um, under the English Empire, uh, but you know, under great uh, oppression from the British. And you find towards the end of the story, uh, he will be further, his romance will be further killed by British accents. Right? So you'll hear two people speaking in English accents and that will seal the annihilation of his love. So the entire idea of love and romance uh, and this very impaled presence which will come into the accent will uh, definitely you know, squash any idea of romance at the end of the story, which we'll see in due course. Okay. So when I came home to dinner, my uncle was not, had not yet been home. Still, it was early. I sat staring at the clock for some time and when the ticking began to irritate me, I left the room. So again, um, Almost all the modernists were uh, massively influenced by Henri Bergson's uh, thesis on time. Uh, I may have mentioned this in my 
lectures on Eliot, especially Eliot's early poetry, the whole idea of clock time and real time, or temp and durie, uh, which were the terms used by Bergson. Uh, temp is obviously clock time, the standard time that's shared by everyone, uh, but that's not important in modernist imagination. What is important is durie, uh, which is real time, uh, or psychological time, uh, which is an embodied time, the, the embodied engagement with time, and how that uniquely situates you, apropos of time, right? So, and that can be completely out of sync with clock time and that's uh, that's something which we keep coming uh, we keep encountering in modernism uh, one of my favorite examples is yet's poem called vacillations uh, you can look it up uh, it's a very autobiographical poem where this is about his 50th birthday it's the poet wb yet sitting in london and he's sitting in a cafe watching the metropolis go by and then there's this lovely line where he says for 20 minutes more or less uh, such was my happiness that i was blessed and could bless right so the whole point of being transported to a blessedness within this time frame of 20 minutes, which is obviously a parody of clock time, and that is just superficially described and then moved away from. But the whole point is moving to a time in which he was so blessed that he could bless, right? So that's like a transportation in time. And that was an obsession that most modernists had, starting with Proust, of course. Uh, the entire modernism's obsession with time starts with Proust, uh, which is, you know, and it's literally titled this book, uh, In Search of Lost Time. So it's all about temporality to a great extent. So Joyce too, uh, if you read Ulysses, when we read Ulysses in this course, you'll find, again, we have the same obsession with time. It's one clock, uh, it's one calendar day in terms of clock time, but that is completely immaterial. And in one calendar day, we have this numerous passages of time which come and go. And sometimes you think that it's one calendar day, which is like a very favorite architectonic of modernists. It's very deliberately designed, uh, just to hammer home the parody of time that they do. It's like clock time or calendar time is completely immaterial. And hence, they situate this very superficial one day uh, deliberately just to sort of prove to us that how that one day is completely immaterial because in, in one day, we can have so many transportations of time, so many passages of time, so many experiences of time, which is the most important thing. So over here to uh, time is an enemy, uh, as he has very clearly mentioned, temporality is a dragon uh, to him in his nightly quest. So he's sitting staring at the clock, which is obviously the metaphor of the enemy. And the irritating clock, which is taken by, uh, is getting on his nerves quite literally. So I left the room, I mounted the staircase and gained the upper part of the house. Again, look at the verb, gain the upper part of the house. It's like a you know, triumph metaphor, victory metaphor. He's already in a nightly quest. So pay very, very attention, close attention to Joyce's use of language. I mean, each word means something in Joyce, especially in a short story, which is more economical than a longer narrative, a longer uh, novel. So again, the upper part of the house, it's like a war he's having, a battle with the adult, the loveless adult, uh, the non-parent adult. So in this battle, he's gained the upper part of the house as a spatial victory. The high, cold, empty, gloomy rooms liberated me. Uh, interesting use of adjectives, high, cold, empty, gloomy. And all these rooms come together to liberate him. Right? It's like a liberation he gets from those rooms. And I went from room to room singing. So again, it's like a metaphor of victory. So I just like a wild victory song. So I gained the part of the house and I'm, I'm enacting this victory song across your dark, cold, gloomy rooms. And this is a really interesting bit. And um, uh, this is a very good example of those of you interested in any research in modernism and cinema should code this in great details and should look at this section in great details. And this is on your screen. From the front window, I saw my companions playing below in the street. I mean, this is a classic example of a reversal of gaze. So look at the way in which he's transported to the upper part of the house, which he has gained uh, out of a victory with an adult. And now he can look down upon his companions uh, playing down in the street. From the front window, I saw my companions playing below in the street. Their cries reached me weakened and indistinct. So very symbolically, he's departed from his companions. He is now eroticized uh, into a matured imagination, to a matured manliness. And his companions, who are like children on the street, uh, who have the same clock time, by the way, the same biological time in their bodies, uh, but he's transported because he has experienced a different kind of existential time, a different sense of uh, psychological time, which is very erotic, very imaginative, very fantastic, quite literally. And as a result of which, uh, he has his gaze of condescension, this gaze of superiority is looking down on the companions from the front window. I saw my companions playing below in the street. It's a typical classic camera gaze uh, that is being used to look down upon inhabitants down below and also look at the way in which the visual gaze and the existential departure are equated together. This is a gold standard in modernist writing. Their cries reach me weakened and indistinct 
and leaning my forehead against the cool glass, uh, I looked over the dark house where she lived. Right, again, look at the nightly metaphors over here. I looked over the dark house where she lived, leaning my head on the cool glass. I may have stood there for an hour, seeing nothing but the brown clad figure cast by my imagination, touched discreetly by the lamplight at the curved neck, at the hand upon the railings, and at the border below the dress. Again, the very metonymic fragmented gaze, the camera gaze looking at certain fragments of the body, the border below the dress, the curved neck, the hand upon the railings. So this particular passage uh, is like a gold mine uh, for those of you interested in visual narratives and modernism. Right? So take a look at the way in which the existential superiority of the boy is conveyed to us by the way he's looking down upon his companions from a window. And then of course, uh, he looks over at the dark house as a panoramic long shot. Uh, from the window where she lived. And then obviously the one little passage which is again mocking clock time and uh, may have stood there for an hour. It doesn't matter uh, whether it's one hour or four hours. It, it's what actually matters is the psychological time. Where am I psychologically situated in time? So the clock time may have been one hour. It doesn't matter at all. But I saw nothing but the brown clad figure cast by my imagination. So again, the brown clad figure, it has a quasi-religious symbolism about it. It's something like a divine figure. But of course, it's highly erotic. It's the ultimate erotic figure for him, uh, which is that erotic quality is you know, displayed immediately after this uh, because the figure has been touched discreetly by the lamplight at the curved neck. So look at the way in which the lamplight and his organic gaze are equated together. So again, this is a classic case of very complex visual narrative. The lamplight and its eye light are being equated together, are mapped onto each other, and both of them are working together in sync to take a look at the object of desire. Right? The lamplight but at the curved neck, at the hand upon the railing, and at the border below the dress. Very metonymic, very fragmented, classic close-up camera techniques, which are used to describe uh, the object of desire by the male imagination. Okay, so I stop at this point today and hopefully. Uh, in the next lecture or maybe in the next couple of lectures, we'll finish the story and then we have another uh, rehearsal of some of the topics which we've discussed already about Dubliners and then we'll move on to the next story in this particular collection. Thank you for your attention.